we'll go live. Right. I am good to go. All right, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to week three of RAGIS. I am Rachel White, a doctoral student here at ODU in the Department of Curriculum Instruction and Science. On behalf of Old Dominion University and RAGIS um, team, it is my privilege and honor to serve as the moderator for this session on playing with perception, designing virtual experiences to engage the census. Our presenters for this session include John Shaw, currently is a senior project scientist at the Virginia Modeling Analysis Simulation Center, VMAS, and equally pursuing a PhD within computational modeling and simulation engineering department, which he is looking to complete this year. His research is in the use of virtual environments, augmented and virtual reality engineering, the use of serious games for advancement in education, data visualization techniques with AR VR technology and agent based modeling applications involving complex systems. And COM is a lecture of English for academic purposes at Old Dominion University. Here she works at the English Language Center, which is a part of the Center for Glo Global Engagement. In addition to her work on language acquisition, her current research is interdisciplinary and focuses on finding ways to combine design, accessibility, and justice by humanizing data and centering the human experience in education. Feel free to utilize the chat and Q&A at the bottom of the toolbar, and please join me in welcoming John and Anne. Hi, everybody. So I'm gonna start us off just really quickly with a short announcement. So um, I'm gonna have a quick note on a resource. So throughout the talk, um, if you wanna have access to the chat, if you're watching live on YouTube or watching this as a video, we'll also make sure that we include links um, hopefully within the description. After the talk, make sure you check the resources page for additional documents to access our slides, as well as a document that provides language support for those who want to improve English for STEM using this, um, using this talk today. And so just to get us started, um, I'm not sure how many people are here currently, but on a scale of cat, um, we thought we would just see how everyone is feeling today, see where you are in your own space, um, wherever you may be. So if you'd like to, you can go ahead and type a number in the chat. So John says he is six, for example. I think I'm feeling a bit like, I think I'm a mix of six and also maybe a little seven, <laughs> so a little tired. <laughs> Um, all right. All right. We have a six. We have a six. <laughs> and you can feel free to go ahead and keep writing in the chat if you'd like to, but if not, I'm going to go ahead and pass off the talk to John. Um, I'll also be throughout his talk, writing some additional information in the chat, sharing some terms or links that I think are relevant that will help you. Um, and if not, without further ado, here's John. Thank you very much. So as uh, was gratefully introduced there, my name is John Shaw. I'm a, I'm a lead project scientist at the Virginia Modeling Analysis Simulation Center. It's a lot. We just say VMASC for short. So I have a background in statistics and some marketing work. I spent a lot of time in the restaurant industry working through my master's degree and my undergraduate degree as well. So I did finish my master's in modeling and simulation. Um, I've been using game engines since, I don't know, during high school back in 1999. I, I helped make something what's called a mod or a modification uh, of an original game called Half-Life. My game that I made as the mod was called Day of Defeat. Um, that was actually acquired by Valve in 2003. So I like to bring that up because it's something that it's how it got me into where I am currently. So I've taken a very interesting path that is not what I would consider normal. Uh, for people that are kind of in this sort of profession right now. So I've been doing for the last 10 years or so, I've spent a lot of time in kind of virtual environments. Another way of kind of expressing that is mixed reality and pretty much been at VMAS since 2017. All right, so what is the Virginia Modeling Analysis and Simulation Center? Um, it's a research, it's a research operational facility that's multidisciplinary, uh, includes over a hundred various research faculty, scientists, and students. They perform scientific research in a wide area of a wide range of areas. Uh, generally, the domains right now are in cybersecurity, critical infrastructure systems, digital shipbuilding, space flight and autonomy, 
digital health, policy and decision-making systems, mission engineering and integration systems, and uh, warfighter and performance readiness. So the facility, we have a, a dozens of labs that are dedicated that can be kind of converted to whatever the research faculty needs. So in the top right picture, you're seeing our larger lab, which is called our SEAL lab, which is simulation experience analytics lab. And you see a bunch of you know equipment on the ceiling. That's things that we can bring down if we needed special power or if we need to do some high level kind of motion capture. Um, we have some equipment that does that stuff as well. Historically, VMASC has generally done a lot of work um, within the Department of Defense, but over the last few years, things have been shifting into other uh, industries, like I'd mentioned previously. All right, so but kind of before we get started, um, I'd like you to maybe take, I don't know, 30 seconds or so for, uh, for some questions I'm going to pose at you. And, you know, kind of go with me here if you don't mind. So close your eyes a little bit. And, and think about smelling a lemon or a lime, right? What's the first kind of memory that comes to mind? Let's give you a little bit of time to think about that. I'm gonna come back and go ahead and do that myself here. Okay, so now keep, you know, keep your eyes closed and now think about smelling um, a rose. And what again, what's that, what's that thought or thing that comes to mind? And you know, feel 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 free to you know throw some of your first thoughts in chat if you want. We're gonna you know, keep that thought. We're gonna maybe come back to this in a little bit. But we don't want to put that in there and kind of get you thinking about these type of things. You're like, what are we about to do? I mean, we'll get into that. We'll get into that. All right, so before we kind of dive in, you know, what are what are our high high things we're going to learn today? What's the high objectives? So what is perception? It's one thing we're definitely going to talk about. What is an interface? What is a sense or is what I already know correct? So for example, you know, a sense that everyone thinks about is is vision, right? My eyes here. It's a sensory organ, it's dedicated towards the sense of vision. So how does all this information kind of come together to connect, to create this very unique time right now for very, I would consider massive leaps and advancements in technology and interfaces and these virtual spaces and smells and everything else that we've already started to talk about. All right, so to begin, let's really go after what is perception. And let's think of, um, well, I'm gonna give you like a simple kind of simple example. So really perception is the way in which you notice things through our, our senses and our sensory organs. So it's you know, the ability to see and hear the senses and, and how they become aware of something you know, through these senses that's in our kind of environment. So perception, it, like how we perceive our environment through these senses and importantly, our interactions with interfaces. So I want to throw kind of an example of like an interface and we'll go into the definition of an interface here uh, quickly. An example I like to think of is Braille. So if you don't know what Braille is, that's okay. I don't, don't expect everybody to know. Think of it as it's, and you can see it in this picture, it's, it's this bumped, raised, uh, these dots. You can feel them. It's an interface that you, that you haptically can feel, which is a sense of, uh, a way of sense of touch. And we perceive this, like I said, through our touch. And as you go along, what we're really doing is getting textual information through touch. So generally people that know Braille usually have low or impaired vision. So with perception, you know, I'm gonna start talking about interfaces and generally we really focus in on, unfortunately we have a bias of about two of these senses, eyes and ears for the most part or vision and hearing is generally the two senses that we kind of know the most about right now. Um, and a lot of times that's just because of, these are also somewhat the easier ones to do research in. So it's really kind of important, like we really need you all to think about, you know, what, why, why is this the thing? There are so many other senses we have and we need more research there. And so some of the work I do, it kind of covers into that. 
but it's really important to really think about that for you know upcoming you know, the next generation of scientists and, and engineers. It's really important from a from a sensory perspective to start thinking about these things. All right. So I mentioned you know, and we mentioned interface. We did a simple definition of perception. So what's what you know what are interfaces? So this can get a little complicated. I'm going to try to keep it simple and keep it kind of high level. So it's this place at which unrelated objects or systems meet and act on each other or communicate. So I don't want to, it's not like these two unknown objects are out there in the world and they're just talking to each other. Talking is something we, we associate with humans. It's more or less that you have objects that, that, that provide information that we maybe perceive through our senses that inform us about something. Right, and it's that coming together, that point at which they they come together. There is then thus an interface, and so very like high high level, you can think about interfaces are 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 literally everywhere. I mean, they're everywhere, right? So, um, and we mentioned you know, perception. It can be thought of, of also itself as an adaptive interface. So our own perception in itself is a interface. So there's a great quote, um, this we see it on the screen, his name, the researcher is uh, Brandon Hookway. And he says, you know, don't focus on the technology, don't focus on the computer screen, the keyboard, right? D to think of the interface, don't think of it as the technology, but think of it as the relationship we have. So I might be sitting here going through this presentation, hitting the keys. It's not, it's not the keys, it, it's the relationship I have with the keys is the interface. And that moment of interaction is the interface that we're that I'm using currently. So I'm gonna show a picture here of a what I call a normal chair. So there's a relationship that that is between the senses here and all of our previous experiences with a chair. And there's communication that occurs as I see this chair, as I maybe touch the chair, as I maybe reposition my body to sit in the chair. So all these things are, are communicating to interact and to engage with this chair. I'm gonna show you this other chair. So it's a little different looking, right? Visually, my eyes are maybe slightly confused. I'm not sure what would, maybe I have to kind of look around this thing. I'm not sure what this object is. And I first saw it, um, you know, maybe some people go, oh yeah, that's a chair. It's just a fancy chair. <laughs> When I first saw it, I actually thought it was something maybe you hung on the wall. Like I just saw this, I was like, oh, maybe I need to put up, put that on the wall. Like it's a piece of art or something like that to watch, not to, not to engage with from a normal chair's perspective or a normal chair's interface, right? So let's kind of transition a little bit about, so then I know a little bit about what an interface is. Now, what does that mean for kind of virtual reality or maybe virtual environments? I'm going to take a sip real quick. All right, so first, you know, what is virtual reality? So again, give you a, a nice kind of definition, very much find this online. I believe this one is from Google. It's the computer generated simulation of a three-dimensional image or environment that we can interact with in some way. Interaction piece is pretty important. So what is a virtual environment then, right? So we have VR, and I think some people have an idea of what that is, and I will go into that. But let's really first focus in on virtual environments. So a virtual environment can really be thought of, let's just say any day normal software or maybe an app, right? So like how maybe I use the computer uh, to write a document um, I maybe use some word processing software. And so in that word processing software, I am in a virtual environment, right? Maybe it's not the most fun virtual environment, but it is a virtual environment. A lot of times people mix this idea of that a virtual environment is something like what you see in a game or you see in a, a computer generated image. So there's another kind of term I wanna put in called immersive virtual environments. And so immersive virtual environments, similar to virtual environments, are really is this more or less, you can kind of think of them as, you know, let's, let's think about like a video game or something that has got a high level of interaction. So it's not something that's static. It's usually something that you're able to kind of get yourself into and, and engage with it. So the difference between these two is not very hard to find. 
it's more or less how a user feels about where they are and how they're engaging. So I know a lot of people that have done, that do virtual art and they're using some software. So they're in a maybe virtual environment, but they're so immersed in what they're creating that you could actually argue that that software, you know, like, like Adobe Photoshop, for example, maybe it itself is also an immersive virtual environment. So it's really kind of dependent upon the user of that piece of virtual environment to kind of go between what that means. So I wanted to mention this because for the most part, when I talk about virtual reality, I'm really talking about the immersive virtual environments and how we use virtual reality as an interface, right, to engage with this immersive virtual environment. So it's really more or less, uh, again, like an interface of how we work through that. And so it's really, you know, VR really gives us the ability to kind of get closer to that virtual environment. And there's another term I want to put out because I think you're going to hear it quite a bit as you're looking up information about this. And it's called presence. So this idea of presence in VR is also this concept of you're so immersed in the virtual environment that it kind of takes you over. And so I might be sitting here in this office doing this presentation, but maybe if I was in a, a vir fully immersive a virtual environment, I would feel like I wasn't in my office, right? And so when I start to feel like I'm maybe somewhere else or my imagination is running, I'm having a high level of presence. So it's a big term you'll hear a lot about, oh, the new brand new VR headset gives you high levels of presence. And what they're really trying to say is that it's like, oh, wow, it's very immersive, right? You're really engaged within the this virtual environment. So I'm gonna throw a little piece of hardware in here. And we're gonna talk a lot about hardware on the next slide. The picture I just dropped in is what's called the Oculus Quest 2. It is a all-in-one device. So what you see right there is that's the whole device. It's a headset you put it on, you've got these controllers. Right, so that's a virtual reality device basically on the market you can buy it right now it's about the most advanced consumer version of, of what you can get so i also want to hint at there's some other terms out there you're going to hear something called augmented reality you're going to hear something called mixed reality you hear something called extended reality xr um it's important to understand where they all kind of engage, where they all overlap. Uh, extended reality is kind of the cumbersome of all of these spaces. For the most part, these terms exist right now because of how we interface with these immersive virtual environments. So the terms exist primarily because we're certain limits of the technology right now. At some point in the future, I think it'll all kind of become one term. I don't know what term's gonna win out. I don't think anybody knows, but a lot of people online have very strong opinions about this. So I figured it would be important to, to understand that. So, you know, feel free to drop in the chat if, um, you know, what's your version of what augmented reality is or what do you think maybe extended or mixed reality would be and maybe why they're different. I'll let you throw that in there and I'm gonna keep going here. So I mentioned about VR, and we're going, to, we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive, so hopefully I don't spend too much time here, but I think it's important to understand. And um, really, I want to get into the hardware of VR, and there's a couple things, and I'll try to keep it light, so I apologize up front. But VR from a hardware standpoint right now, again, in this picture, this, this gentleman's wearing an Oculus Quest, it's a headset, or a, another way of hearing is head-mounted display. He has two controllers, right? Each piece of this hardware, there's a there's a term called six degrees, so the, the, the number six, there we go, <laughs> degrees of freedom. And what that means is we'll focus in on the first three degrees of freedom. So you have, um, of you know, yaw, Y-A-W, which is left or right, right? So I can look left or right. I have pitch, so I can look up and I can look down. And then you have roll, and roll is kind of like if I wanted to put my ear on my shoulder, right? So you put those together and that's three degrees. So I put a headset on, I can look up to the left, look down, look right, roll. The other three degrees are then usually with translation or transformation or you know, how I might move. So I might move in a forward direction. I might move in a backward direction. I might move laterally, left to right. I might rotate, turn with my head, right? So that's the last three degrees of freedom. So when you put those together, what that really lets you do is 
basically move through the environment like we normally do, right? So the hardware is able to, to do that as well. So inside this headset, there's a ton of sensors and they're doing a bunch of stuff behind the scenes. You can kind of see in this picture, it might be a little hard to tell, there's these two small kind of dots right here. Those are pretty much um, cameras, very, very similar to the ones on your, your phone. They're a little bit of what's called a wider angle. They're there to capture how you move through your environment. So fun trick with these headsets is if I put you in a white boxed room or a very blank space, they can't work. <laughs> they need to see the differences in motion of how you move to know how far you've actually moved. And so you have the controllers for each hand. And again, there's a lot of embedded sensors in the controller, do the same thing with the six degrees of freedom, move all around with the controller. You can use these triggers and these buttons to engage with your virtual environment, right? So these interfacing mechanisms here to do things like reach, pick up, grab. Almost all of the headsets also come with stereo audio. It's really important actually to have really good audio um, for kind of that high level of immersion and presence. And, um, and so you're gonna hear coming up, you know, just to give you guys a little future action, you're gonna hear a lot about better audio from these companies. Apple specifically has mentioned a new way of doing more volumetric or what would be more physics-based audio to uh, give you more immersion, right? So it's important, I just wanna make sure I hit on that. And so why do you think these, these hardwares have to be so complicated? It's a lot going on behind the scenes. It's taken a lot of years of research and a lot of money to get all this packed into a very easy to use piece of equipment. And it's because our perception within VR is actually probably the closest thing to how we are in the real world. So the interface of that needs to like, it needs to be simple. Like I can just move around my, I want to go pick up something. I just walk over and pick it up, right? To do that in VR, very complicated, but you wouldn't know it because it's got such an interesting interface and how they've done it kind of behind the scenes with all these sensors. So it's, it's important to bring this up because by definition, trying to recreate a virtual space is in itself very challenging. Okay. So I've gone on a lot about um, kind of uh, VR and, and virtual and physical. And so I wanna kind of get back to kind of the heart of this perception of an environment. And, and so um, that's through kind of the, um, the senses, right? So in chat, share how many senses you think we have, right? So eyes, ear, smell, touch, right? How many senses do you think we have? Well, you know, while you're putting that in there and we'll look at that, I'm gonna look at that a little bit later. Well, you know, what is a sense, right? Eyes, ears, nose, touch, taste. That's five, right? That's usually what a lot of people think is with five senses. Well, what's the definition? So the definition of a sense is a biological system used by an organism, I'm an organism, for sensation and the process of gathering information about the world and responding stimuli, right? All right, so you think it's five, right? I think that's for the most part, a lot of people think, oh, it's five. I think some people maybe you're saying that oh, there's maybe a couple more out there. Well, um, Let's, um, I'm gonna, let me go back here real quick. So what if I told you that if you asked a neurologist, right? So a neurologist is a special, especially person in anatomy and they functions and they look at the nervous system. If you act a neurologist, how many senses, they would probably tell you, they think there are nine, nine senses, right? Like what? Four more senses? What are these other senses? This is crazy. And the reason they would do this is they, they would say, okay, there's one called thermoception, Thermo, thermo, ah, the sense of heat, right? Not cold, heat, you know, some arguments there, but anyways, we're gonna keep going. So neurologists also would think of something called equal, I can always mess this word up. We'll just say equilibrium or equilibrium reception, sorry, equilibrium or the perception of balance. So the inner ear is a sense organ that helps us with balance. When that gets off, you can get sick, you can feel you know, not right, you can actually be very ill and have to be bedridden, it's a pretty bad thing. 
You also have proprioception or the perception of body awareness. This idea that if I close my eyes and I reach out with my hand and I go to touch my nose, how am I able to do that? Right. This is this idea of perception of body awareness. And then the ninth, the ninth sense, they would say, is something called no susception, which is interesting because no susception almost sounds like no, <laughs> no sense, but no, no susception or the perception of pain. All right. So that, to me, that makes a lot of sense. Those nine senses. So it's not five anymore. It's, you know, nine now all of a sudden. Well, if you ask some other people, they might actually think we have upwards of over 50 50 senses, which to me is maddening. But when you break it down, it doesn't sound too crazy. They think it's more along kind of categorizing these senses. So you, you have kind of like chemical senses, right? This idea of hunger for food. What is that? That's a sense. I feel hungry, right? There's something going on there. Um, radiation senses, the sense of mood, the sense of color, right? Feeling senses, another category they hit on. So again, sensitivity, gravity, very similar to equilibrium. Air and wind pressure, so you can feel that. And, and that might be different than touch. Uh, emotions, part of that as well. And then the other kind of category that usually will batch some of these senses in is called mental senses. So, you know, pain or mental or spiritual distress. You know, there's something going on there internally, right? So sense of self, sense of friendship. All right. So the thing to take away from this is that, you know, we're sensory creatures and our senses are really, really a large part of who we are. Um, and, and this dives into social norms, this dives, you know, cultural backgrounds, um, all of it. I, I bring it up because it's important to understand that, that how we, we need to think about this. We need to understand senses more and better to really try to maybe build something that we want somebody to experience that is going to be, can be experienced for all, right? All right, so we can focus in on the, on smell real quick. So it's also called the olfactory, which is an interesting word. So we, we don't know um, much about it, actually. So what researchers do kind of know is that we, we, we bin we bin our smells, right? So what does that mean? Well, so um, earlier I asked you about, think about the smell of a lime or a lemon. So for the most part, you ask different people from different cultures, they'll actually substitute them, right? Some people say there's a clear definition, a lime is, does not smell like a lemon. Other people say, uh, researchers say that actually we bin them together. So in, so in one culture that might be viewed as a uh, very clean smelling. And another culture, it might be, you know, kind of like, too pungent, too strong of a smell, right? So something else that this research knows is that we actually develop our sense of smell in the womb. It's one of the only senses, traditional senses, that is pretty much fully developed in the womb. A lot of our other senses, they kind of develop over the time, over a window of time of our life. The thing I find crazy out of what research has shown is that by the age of 10, for the most part, our smell, like library, our olfactory, our sense is basically locked in. And what that means is that at that point in time, we know what is something that would smell, quote, good or pleasant. And we know for ourselves what would smell kind of bad or not good. And so um, I, br I bring that up because it's different culturally. That's why I asked that question before. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, I mentioned that it's the only thing developed in the, in the womb. Um, and the, the, the thing, it's why it's so locked in by 10. And if you think about now what you thought about when I asked you that question, it starts to make sense a little bit. To me, it does. And so the reason why is, is research is able to show that smells and emotion are stored as one memory. So when you go through this experience and there's a smell involved, there's an emotional response that's triggered and stored and the brain activity is this kind of the same. And so we store that stuff together. So it makes a lot of sense um, to me, you know, no pun intended. <laughs> um, so, and I don't want to give anything away. There's a movie that just came out uh, from Marvel called Black Widow, um, but they actually use 
the sense of smell in a very interesting way. I won't give it away, but something to think about. So if you haven't seen the movie, when you see the movie, I want you to, you go, oh, I bet he mentioned that. All right, so let's kind of do a recap of kind of where we're at. So um, so for the most part, you know, what we've, what we've gone through is that at some point in our, 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 our lives, we get to this point where we kind of, we have this smell library, it starts to be built in. And then from there on out, we're very much kind of predetermined to have a series of judgments and emotional responses that can be triggered or activated by those certain smells, right? Um, and also can be kind of a put off in other cases, right? So what smells great to me might not be so great to the next person and vice versa. So the lemons, I think of usually kind of light and airy and cleaning. I actually think of cleaning. So I'm, I'm and I'm thinking of this because when I was little, I believe my mom used a lot of, um, uh, what was it, uh, uh, Lysol with a lemon scent. So I have this sense of like cleanliness when I smell a lemon or a lime. And when I smell a rose, I smell kind of like more of the perfume. And I think it relate. I think of an emotion and response triggers back to you, the smell of, um, I didn't get a, I didn't get a chance to know my grandmother. She had passed away prior, but my grandfather had kept a bottle of her perfume. And when I was a little kid, I remember I, <laughs> I kind of spilled a little bit of it. And so there's this memory that comes back of that event. So it's funny. It's not a memory of my grandmother. It's memory of, of me spilling this bottle of perfume that has an association with her. So, and then people have other mixed feelings about that. that's why we asked that because it's different for a lot of people, but it's also sometimes the same for others. All right. So I'm going to kind of go through this one a little quicker. Um, this idea of a smell interface. It's, we've talked about interfaces. Now we've talked about olfactory and smells a little bit. So if, if, you, if you think about everyday interactions, what is the thing? And, and feel free to throw this into the chat. But think of, can you think, I'm giving you a hint here. Uh, can you kind of think of something or name something that uses smell as an interface to let us know something, right? And there's more than just this one. And I put this one here because I think it's the most, one of the most universal ones I could think of um, is natural gas. So natural gas does not have a smell. It is it's zero smell. Problem with that is if you fill a space with natural gas and you're human or you breathe air, you can, unfortunately, you can die. So they have to introduce this kind of really odd, chemically funky smelling smell into natural gas. So when, if we have a gas leak or if I left a stove on, my nose goes, hey, what, what, what is that? Something's wrong. Oh my gosh, I, I left I left the stove on. And they did that because gas spreads in kind of a volume. And so in order to have that kind of be, you know, go through to you, it made, made a lot of sense to attach it chemically to the gas itself. So that's one kind of smell interface that exists. There are lots of other ones, but I wanted to bring that one because it's the most kind of, I think, universal, at least within the United States. It could be different in other countries. Um, so a lot of times, though, that you might think, well, why aren't we there yet? And it's because it's expensive. Right now, it's very expensive to do this type of work. Uh, and so one thing I like to bring up is this thing called the ion mobility spectroscopy. You're like, what is that? If anybody has traveled on an international or even domestic flight, you've probably encountered that device. You might not have known it. It's when you, if you've ever been swabbed, sometimes at the airport, you, they might randomly pull you out and they'll run this little piece of like cotton ball on your hand and then they'll put it in front of this machine. The machine they're putting in front of is that. And that machine is basically looking for the presence of gas, explosive chemical traces. It's a digital nose, right? So I wanted to bring that in there because it's very, very expensive and it's very, interesting it's why why we use it and why it can be very helpful and you're going to start to see things like that become more uh, accessible and cheaper i also throw something here called the geneva emotion and odor scale research work that tries to show culturally and you'll see brazil and switzerland and sections of the united states what makes us slightly different and how certain odors we might react differently so, you know, you might say, oh, well, I love the smell of lemons and I'm going to put lemon smell everywhere. Well, you know, it might not be true for everybody. 
All right, so the brain, memory, and sense perception, I'm gonna kind of breeze through this. This is a little more in depth. Our sensory, our brain through our senses is this kind of black box. Information stimulus goes in, information is gonna come out from a perception. Our brain's gonna go, have I experienced this before? So if it's something new, like when I traveled to um, the Caribbean for the first time, my brain was on overload. Everything was smelled great. It was totally a sensational overload. So I had never been there before. So I never experienced it. My brain had to kind of do all this additional work. I felt like time went a little slower or maybe it went a little faster. There's some research that talks about that. And the whole time my brain is trying to put my previous experiences together to anticipate kind of what's next. What is this new environment? What's going on? I'm getting hit with all these floral smells and the, the everything's so green and colors are different. And so then, you know, my you know, brain's kind of going like, all right, did I, did I, did that, is that like how I would expect? Well, yeah, trees grow up. Yeah. Trees grow up there too. Okay. Whew, everything's good to go. And we kind of move on. The more and more you go through the same experience, think of like traffic, the more and more the brain starts to like go on autopilot. That's something just to think about because it's, it's going to come up in some of the work we've done. And I'm going to get to that here shortly. All right, so I'm glad we got to this. I want to kind of take a little step back here. So here's a static image of something that we could say is very primitive to what it means to be human. The concept of fire. Right? Most of us have grown up in some level and have experienced fire. This element in many different ways. But yet we all share some sort of cultural connections. Like other elements in our physical environment, we can learn through our experiences to respect it, to be marvel at it, to share stories around it, to cook with it, to destroy with it, to celebrate with it, uh, to be afraid of it, to not be afraid of it. Such a simple image can instill a lot of powerful responses. But what happens if we take this image and let's maybe, you know, let's tune it up a notch, right? All right, so here we have some fire and it's moving now. So now with the visual motion of fire and its movement, it's sort of this dance. So for the most of us, this random pattern of fire really dazzles our vision system and our brain is just mesmerized as we're looking at it. And you don't know it's a, such a small loop, but our brain just can't even connect the dots sometimes of where it's looping. We understand that it's normal, but every time it's slightly different. So the brain's kind of getting hit with this, you know, the eyes are getting this new experience. It's, it's it can be hypnotic, right? The motion of it, but let's, let's take it up another notch. Make sure you hear that. So now we introduce sound, right? The crackling of wood, this constant sound of chemical properties, of wood changing, pop of rushing air, right? As it's hitting that fire. There's something with the fire and the sound that when you combine the visual with the audio, you're just kind of taken to a different experience. Now at this point in the chat, uh, as we're running out of time, let's see what, you know, let's get some perspective. So as you're kind of looking at this fire and you're hearing this fire, tell me, you know, where are you right now? Where are you mentally? So normally what I would do if I was presenting this and we were all in person, well, what I would have done is we would have talked a little bit more about the big five senses and we get a lot of various interesting responses traditionally you know people talk about growing up around the fire growing up in the outback growing up you know in the, in the woods or some people have never really had that experience some people associate with with charcoaling and grilling all various types but usually involves some level of people normally a lot of times it's food and people and then what i do is what i don't tell you is in the space i actually release the smell of something burning and if I show you a fire and I do it, people get really confused because they don't expect it. They're like, wait, I'm in a conference room. Why am I smelling fire? But I'm seeing fire and they know we're talking about senses. So they kind of go, oh, you almost got me. Now, if I don't show you this and I show you something completely random, just some random YouTube video, but I hit you with that smell of fire, your brain instantly goes, there is something wrong. I need to get up and I need to get out, right? So this is primitive smell. And its association as a sense by itself means very different things unless it's not combined with other senses. So I bring that up 
because it's important to how we then use that information to build some of these immersive virtual environments. Much as I love the sound, we do have to go to the next slide. All right, so let's talk about Disney and how they take advantage of this. So they are a perception uh, manipulator here. I'm sorry for the, the triple X's, that's not supposed to be there. <laughs> I'm supposed to get rid of that text box. Um, as Disney, when you, if you've never been, I'll try to give you a picture of what it's like walking through. So when you first walk into the park, there is this kind of area that's kind of like called Main Street. And it's this kind of traditional Americana 1950s setup where you have these stores on both sides. And as you're walking, you know, you get hit with these, these like smells. It just smells so good, right? You're getting, there's like this vanilla smell. There's this kind of cookie smell. And, you know, you just think, well, it's just the shops. It's the bakeries. And, and really what's happening is Disney's actually designed, they have engineered these, uh, these smell devices. And you know, the bottom right picture is this patent image that you can find. And it's called the Smellitzer. It's a fun word. And what it does is, is this particular technology lets you introduce little bits of different smells at different intervals of time. Now, why would they want different smells at different intervals of time? Well, they want to put it throughout the park or maybe as the future progresses, they know what their on average day of visitors might be. Maybe they know they have a lot of visitors coming from, I don't know, the Northeast of the United States. So let's change that smell to be like, oatmeal cookies because they know that a majority of their visitors like oatmeal cookies. What better way to try to hijack your perception and your senses to get you to feel comfortable, right? The smell of vanilla for me comforts me. And that's actually true for most people. They've done studies of that. So again, why do you think Disney is taking advantage of this? Because they want you to have a good experience. So they're, they're kind of hijacking your senses, right? This other one in the in the middle here, this other uh, patent, it's about how they wanted to build speakers and, and sound emitting devices into everything. And they do this as you walk around the park. You don't realize it, but you go from like 1950s Americana to like future sci-fi world to like jungle Caribbean world. And normally there'd be like this kind of break in reality where your brain's like, what the hell? Like, this isn't, this is weird. Like what's going on? But they, they transition audio scapes throughout the park in such a way to where you just, you just kind of go with the flow and they're just, they're completely hijacking your senses. Right. And it's really, really powerful. All right. So let's talk about what we've actually done at VMask and what I've helped do. First to do that, I need to explain something called Chattahoyak. Chattahoyak is a civilization uh, that was around 7,000 BC up to about 5,700 BC. And for the most part, it's located in what we know as today, Western Turkey. The reason why Chattahoyak is very important to know is it's one of the first known cities to kind of human civilization. And so before I started at VMAS, there was a project to kind of take, so the lower, uh, the left image is an actual real picture of the archaeological dig site. And you see kind of these walls and spaces. And these were rooms that were kind of homes that were built, built on top of each other and houses on top of houses, right? And so we got this information and some 3D artists that work at VMAS recreated the space. And we did that because we wanted to put archaeologists there. We wanted to go back in time and feel like what it might be there. So from a, a VR perspective, it's really powerful. But why do we stop there? Let's talk about the other senses that I've already mentioned, right? So what happens if we go after those other senses? What if we go after touch? What if we go after your nose? What if we go after heat? All right, so how do we do that? All right, so let's talk about fire again. So the top left image, you're gonna see the real prop. And then the image below it, you're gonna see the virtual prop. So you have this bowl with some clay on it and this VR controller right in the middle. And then you see this virtual bowl that's maybe like what they used back then. You'll see this grain bin at the top. It's this physical large wood object. It has rice in it. So when you shift it, you get the shift in weight. You see these fake pieces of wood in the top right. And then you see this virtual wood in the bottom. So what happens is when we put you in a space that looks 
virtually like, you know, you're back 7,000 years ago, but we put you in a space that's the same size. So when you reach out and touch a wall, there's a real wall there. And then you reach out and grab this bowl. There's a bowl there. And you reach out and grab this rice bin and you go to tip it up. And all of a sudden you see kind of virtual rice fall out of it. It's really powerful, right? So we then combine things like a space heater, an electronic heating device that emits heat. And we put it right where the virtual fire was. And of course, what do you think happens? People are like, oh man, I feel the heat. We then had uh, some small device that emitted the smell of burning wood. And so what would happen is, is when we played around with that, as various people participated, we got very interesting results. So for the most part, if we gave you the headset and we gave you the audio and we gave you the, uh, you know, the site, and then we gave you say the electronic heat, you might tell us that you smelled something burning but we did not give you the smell of burning fire. Say we don't give you the heat, but we give you the smell of burning wood. You're gonna tell us you felt the heat. And the reason why this is very interesting is, is I kind of been hinting at it, is that they kind of go together. This memory of, of a fire, it's very hard to, to separate the, the senses apart. It just doesn't work. We just don't work that way. And so you can really you know, take advantage uh, to do this, right? And so, you know, I want to kind of keep time respective here. And so we can basically kind of break your senses. And, and like I mentioned, you know, how we kind of can do this a little bit. So let me see if I can play this just a little bit of it here. I'm going to skip to where we actually do the, the work. Here we go. In the distance. And as you begin your journey through the home, the smells of labor, of sweat and excrement linger in the air. The level of presence becomes second nature, and through the engagement of multiple senses, you begin to participate in daily activities that we recognize today. Smell the burning ashes of the fire. Add more wood to get the fire raging hot. Engage when the oven is ready by feeling the heat of the fire. So you just saw, so that she had no idea. We didn't tell her anything. We didn't tell her what you could do. We just said, hey, we're going to put you in this space and just treat it as real as you want to treat it. And what happens is the moment we hit you with a couple of these sensory experiences and then you see this wood, you want to throw the wood in the fire. And what we do is we engage our little electronic devices to basically increase the heat. We also engage the visuals to be more fire and we throw some sparks at you. And we watch people time and time again step back. I can feel it. It's so hot. Even if we didn't turn the heat on. Right. And it's just the way our body works. And it's how we kind of can start to engineer these uh, perceptions and these senses. So why would that be important? Because of how we apply it to training. Um, and so we can take that information from that experiment and then we can put it into a training environment. So like, how does this type of like fun, weird, like what are these guys doing over there lead to better training? And so what you're seeing in these pictures here is we apply that information that we learned from Chattahoyak and his civilization 7,000 years ago and how we engage at a primal level to then bring it into a flight simulator. So we worked on with a, a local business and we helped build a flight simulator where we had heat lamps. We had the smells of like electricity, kind of like that circuitry burning smell, which is actually the same smell of the ozone, if you're curious. Um, and then we had a, like foggers to introduce fog and different effects. And that was just to try to elevate the experience of training to a different level. Because we talked about how when you first experience something that's brand new, you, your body gets this overload. Well, you don't want that when you're flying a plane or when you're doing anything where there's lives on the line. You want to be ready for that. So if we can hit you with those types of sensory you know, depths, right, really bring it, bring it home to you, you're more likely to maybe elicit the training response. So now it's not about how, how hot everything is. You're just going to act. You're just going to do what you have to do to save the plane or to do, you know, to do the right thing in that, in that approach. So, you know, simulated smells, we can simulate explosions with air cannons. All this stuff is very tied to like kind of how the movie industry works as well. Um, and so here, I know we're really close on time. Um, should turn this over to you, Ann. If, if Ann is there. I was going to say, I think we could probably just go ahead. I know it's almost, um, time is almost up. So maybe we just finalize what you were going to end, end with since it's okay. we have about nine minutes left. So maybe just a minute closure and then time for questions. Yeah, no problem. All right. So let's go ahead and, and speed through this. 
I can put this in the notes, though. This will be in the slides. People can see. This is some work we did with game engines and visualizations of weather data and data that you cannot see. So we had chemical sensors outside and, you know, we were able to visualize visually this interactive watercolor paint, painted experiment. And this is this process of how we digitize this real information back into the, uh, the virtual space. All right, so the different temperature sensors, humidity, vox, and all these other things that are not good to breathe. You don't want to breathe this stuff. And so a lot of times you don't know. You're just out there in the environment. You have no idea. So we try to make the invisible visible. And so, um, you know, game engines are basically the crux of what I've been using for the last, you know, 15, 20 years. And so you see some pictures below here. Um, you can think of these as future operating systems. Uh, the physics simulations are doing light simulations, really, really very real looking. The image to the left is what's called virtual YouTube or VTubers. Uh, it's a real person in real time, basically doing motion capture. And she's becoming this other virtual character avatar and things like that are going to be every day. All right. So kind of to close it all down real quick. Where all this is going is future interfaces have to include more senses. They're going to include more senses because we're going to demand it, right? We're going to want that better experience. And really, it's really about sharing in those experiences and bringing the virtual and the physical together. It's this concept called mirror world. You can look that one up as well. Well, you know, how can this like help society? And I think of that, this expression that you maybe have heard or haven't heard, it's a pretty popular one. This, this idea to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. You know, we have the advancements today to kind of do that at another visceral sensory level that you could have never done 10 years ago. And so it's vitally important, I think, as we move forward to start to do these types of experiences, whether they're comfortable or not because it gives us a chance to really be in that different perspective. So a big group of us at VMask, as we're working through this stuff, realize that the advancements in all these technologies and different sensories immediately become much easier options for accessibility. So things like uh, audio devices to help with hearing, you know, there's some new legislation right now that is gonna try to make that more affordable. So where, why can't I use my, my phone, right? And, and hear better and have it pair with a pair of Bluetooth earbuds that aren't thousands of dollars that let me turn up my hearing, my digital hearing. Same thing we do with pictures on our phones, right? I take a picture and I want to digitally zoom it because my eyes can't see that far, but my camera can. So that's just going to keep advancing. And so I really do think that there's a really great opportunity right now to take this type of information and start to build experiences to let other people know maybe what it's like, right? And so some references. And with that, I'm going to end with, I don't know, about five minutes left. So I apologize. I took a little too long on some of the other slides. Uh, no problem. Thank you, John and Anne, for uh, such a wonderful and informative talk. Um, and, and one thing is, is I, I work in a high school and I know that a lot of students want to get involved in this. Um, and I think the there is one Q&A in the chat, but I think how, did, how would a student you know, what's their first step to get involved in something like this? What would you recommend? So from, from my perspective, I usually think of, of like finding where in your school that there's a crossover. And so a lot of times that's going to be right now, maybe it's computer science and programming, right? I know a lot of people might, that might be kind of a turnoff, but that's one layer. Another layer might be kind of robotics. A lot of what's been going on in robotics for 20 or 30 years, you're just seeing that now smaller and easier to use. So a lot of the sensors that like Anne used for her uh, doing the, the outside invisible visible, that was all more or less from robotics industry from 20, 30 years ago. Um, so I think anything in the kind of that area mm -hmm. and putting things together, I think that's how you do it. So I, I tell most students start looking at those if they offer those classes, if they don't, there's gotta be a, a region or a high school near you that does find out what those programs are. Um, and then, you know, really reach out to, to those teachers because they usually kind of know to some extent. Um, I, I was on a committee to help Virginia make more of these type of things more accessible for high schools. So they're trying. There's trying to set some programs where it should be accessible for all high schools eventually. Perfect. Um, I don't know if you have time for one more. 
Um, and this is kind of interesting question. How do you feel about the idea that our lives are just really good simulations? <laughs> I have a lot of mixed feelings on that. And um, yeah, I could go on and on about that stuff. I think it's one of those things where like, hey, you know, use it to your advantage, right? Think of it in a positive way. If that's true, then that means I should be able to do some pretty cool stuff if I just really, what, put my uh, perception of my mind to it, right? So I can, you know, matrix my own solutions, right? If you really want to get, you know, sci-fi. Um, but yeah, that that is a, man, there's a lot of, a lot of interesting characters, we'll say that, talking about that stuff right now. A lot of philosophers, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, actually, you know, it's a good point. I actually think it's a great opportunity for people to learn and to really dive into some some general philosophy. I myself don't have that background, but in the last couple of years, I've been spending a lot of time reading about that stuff. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us with this session. And please join me in thanking our presenters. All right. Um, I know that Regis is about to start at four o'clock um, a tour of the Jefferson Lab. Um, so if you wanted to tune that in, I think it's in the science room. It might be in the science or main room. I know I should know that, but I don't. Um, but thank you again, everyone, um, and we'll see you soon. Have a good day.